This time we have a children's message, I believe. talking about the creation of the earth and the world. And so right now, I've created a poster card for Donna May. So God's creations, OK? On the first day, God created the light and separated the light from the darkness and called the light day and the darkness night. Can you find the first day one on that card? Is that day one? There you go. There's day one. Day two. God created an expanse to separate the waters and called it sky and ocean. Oh, awesome. Day three. God created dry ground and gathered the waters, calling it the dry ground land, and gathered the waters and called it sea. On day three, God also created vegetation, which is plants and trees. Awesome. All right. Day four, God created the sun and the moon and the stars to give light to the earth and give it, and govern and govern to, and separate the day from the night. These are also served as signs as, to mark the seasons, days, and years. Day five, God created everything, every living creature of the seas and every winged bird, blessing them to multiply and fill the waters of waters and sky with life. Day six, day six, God created the animals to fill the earth, and on day six, God also created man and women, Adam and Eve. In his own image, commune with him, he blessed them and gave them the creatures, gave them creatures and the whole earth to rule over care for and cultivate. And on day seven, God rested. <laughs> There's a creation song. It says, I gotta put my glasses on, I'm sorry. <laughs> it says a creation song. It says, know that the Lord is God. He is He, it is He who has made us, and not our not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. God created everything in six 24-hour days. This original creation was perfect without sin or death. That's what you have That's our secret. Thank you, Nora. That girl's got talent. And I appreciate it. Okay. If you have your Bible this morning, I'm going to direct your attention to the book of Genesis, chapter 7, which is on page 9. I have to believe such small numbers for page numbers where we are. We're in the first book of the Bible. And I'm going to read to you the first five verses out of this. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you, your whole family because I have found you righteous 
in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal. A male and its mate. And one pair of every kind of unclean animal. A male and its mate. And also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, just telling Nora, mark it in your calendar. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. What a statement. What a statement. Could God say that about us? I'm putting me on that. Could God say that about us? And Rick Lauder did all that the Lord commanded him. Janice did all that the Lord commanded her. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Noah was an exceptional man. Two weeks ago when I spoke to you, I'm going to try to sit down here. Two weeks ago, um, we spoke about a God who had regrets. You won't find that in any other part of the Bible. You won't find those no statements any place in the Bible. God said that he regretted. That's a powerful word. I regret that I've made the human race. I regret that I created the earth that we just heard about the week of creation. I regret. Powerful. And you say, but God knows all things, didn't he know? Yeah, he had to have known, but he still regretted when it happened. What was different was the evil that was in the world in Noah's day was worse, worse than God expected. He didn't realize it could have gotten that bad. He knew sin was going to enter the human race. You say, what kind of sin motivated God in this? If you read Genesis and you read these chapters, and the story doesn't begin in the chapter that I'm reading to you today, or it began back earlier, the sin that had God's attention was violence. Violence. Now we know when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone and wiped those two cities right off the map, the sin was not violence in those two cities. We have words in the English language to describe some of the activities of those two cities. Theirs was a moral one. He even tried to entice the angels that went there. Unbelievable. They were out there. But the violence that got God's attention, or the sin that got God's attention, was violence. And as you read through these chapters in early Genesis, something we do not give a thought about is that when human blood is shed, God hears it. God sees it. He says so. He gave a speech to Noah's family after they got off the ark. He said, when human blood is shed, I hear it. Why? Life that came from God. That's how it's transmitted. That's how life is maintained. Once your blood gets in trouble, you're gone. 
That's where life is. That's what we try to do. We have ambulances to leave in a hurry, loaded with equipment to get oxygen back into the blood because blood is where the life is. Got to maintain it and everything that the blood services within the human body got to be maintained. But within minutes, death starts to take over organ by organ. But violence is what got God's attention here. In this generation that Noah lived in, people were angry. And people were doing things to each other. And they were motivated to hurt each other and still help each other. God was tired of it. God never created the human race to die. He created it to live. And that theme is all the way through the Bible. Death is not the design of God. It's the absence of God that creates death. John 3.16, which is quoted so much. But I personally love John 3.17 even more. John 3.16 has got a promise in it about believing and about being converted and about being saved. But John 3.17 says, For God never intended that any should perish, but that they should know everlasting life. Don't think for a minute that God wants to send people to hell. He wants to send them to heaven. Amen. Amen. And I am convinced there are going to be people in heaven that are going to surprise them. How'd you get here? Same way the rest of us did by believing in Jesus Christ and find out that God forgave their sins and we didn't know God had done it. They hadn't met our standard. They met God's standard. Some of them at the end of their lives have done it. Don't underestimate the Spirit of God to save people. Amen. Don't underestimate the Spirit of God in the last moments of people's lives for them to say the fact of repentance and the prayer of faith that's trusting in God. I am not the judge of who goes to heaven. This church is not the judge of who goes to heaven. Only God is. Don't walk away from that fact. And what you don't understand, commit it to God. Commit it to Him. God has not asked me or you to be the judge of who goes to heaven and who doesn't. But the thing I have observed I started watching it as a young minister, and I can't describe myself that way anymore. My, my hair has given me up. But I still am amazed at the people that God forgives and redeems. The church says, no, they can't. And I love it. I serve a risen Savior. It was in the business of saving people, not condemning them. Of forgiving people, not holding a grudge. I love it. I grew up in a church that was very conservative and legalistic. People called themselves fruit inspectors. Oh, if you bear fruit, what kind of fruit? Well, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this, and you have to do that. And if you don't do those things, you ain't going to have it. I'm happy to tell you those fruit inspectors aren't working for the Lord. They thought they were. They weren't. Amen? Amen. And here we got a story about Noah as a very, very different man. He lived a life that was one of the longest in the Bible. His total life was 950 years. 
And he lived 500 years before God gave him a message. So he wasn't always an oddball. He was an ordinary man. But he had a faith and a commitment in God that was different. There are some statements in the Bible about Noah that are very unique. And Noah didn't make them about himself. The book of Genesis was written by Moses under the inspiration of God. It says that Noah was a man that found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And many liked him. Genuinely liked him. You got people in your life you like. You got people in your life you avoid. You got people in your life you just plain don't like. And you're glad that the street has two sidewalks on it so you can take the other one. Or a building has two doors so you can exit the other one. There are people you don't like. Now this is what God said. Noah was a man he, that God had found favor with. That's a tall statement. Oh, I wish I'd love to have God to be able to say that about me at the end of my life. And then he went on to say, Noah was a righteous man. That's why I liked him. Righteous. You know what the righteous means? Doing the right thing. Doesn't mean you're politically correct. Doesn't mean you're educationally correct. Doesn't mean you know how to throw a fastball in the Red Sox. It doesn't mean you know those things. It means you do the right thing morally. I say that's easy to do. No, it isn't. There are days when it's easy to do the right thing. There's other days it takes every ounce and strength of character within you to do the right thing. You know why? You're standing with people that don't agree with you. They don't see as you see. They don't believe as you believe. And then another statement that was made about him is that he was blameless among the people. That meant that nobody had a fight with Noah because he had wronged them. Oh, they might fight with him because they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in what he was doing. He thought he was a little of this, whatever that is. A couple of his marbles weren't right. A couple of his cylinders skipped and misfired. Oh, he's got to be to live the way he lives. What an oddball. But he was blameless in which none of the people that he lived among had he wronged. None of them. Not one of them can say, yeah, that, that Noah, he's a jerk. You wouldn't believe what he did to me. Noah didn't get where he was by taking things away from people by killing their reputation, by stepping on their toes. <laughs> I was at primary care one day in the park. It was tight. They, they overbooked in doctor's offices up there in the morning. And there are not enough parking spaces in the parking lot for all the doctors when they do all their scheduling in the morning. And so people are fighting over parking spaces. <laughs> I stopped one morning. Saw somebody was getting ready to leave this space, so I backed up and gave them room, turned my blinker, and sat there. No soon I had they backed in a car from another direction that had just walked to the park. Boom! Right in the space I was sitting there waiting for. What'd you do? Oh my, my heart skipped a couple beats. I said, well, the drive is on to go find a place I can use. Somebody just took the space I was waiting for. And I got out and have a fight with him. So much effort, actually. <laughs> it wasn't worth it. If you're going to have a fight, fight over something real, not over something small. Well, I eventually found another space that meant I had to walk further. That's it is what it is. Noah was blameless among the people he lived. 
That's quite a reputation. Oh, we, we like to measure our politicians up to that and say, oh, I can find something wrong with this guy, that guy, the other guy. Yeah, you can. But not with Noah. Noah was a blameless man. And then it also said that Noah walked faithfully with God. Faithfully. Faith is a belief and who God is and what He is, what He represents, the character of God is something that you absorb into your lifestyle. On the other side of the trip in the ark, as I mentioned earlier in the service, first thing that Noah did when he got off the ark, he built an altar. Those altars had to be built of stone. And then he had to look for them. You ever look for stone after there's been a flood and a wash and all the sand is covering everything up? They meant Miller had to go out and he had to work for the rocks that he needed because God had said that was the way he wanted altars built. And they were always built out of unhewn stones. Stones that had not been hand chiseled by man, the way God made them. It also meant that out of the animals that he had put on the ark, one of them was not going to fulfill its other mission to populate the earth. Noah took one of the animals he just saved, and he became the sacrifice to God. And the scripture says God could smell the incense of that altar. Hmm. God smelling? That's what the Bible says. And God could smell the incense of a Noah's altar. I've run out of time. I can't give you two-thirds of what I plan to talk about today because we're out of time. But Noah was a righteous man, a good man. He wasn't just a popular guy, a politician, a handshaker. He might have even been a person of few words. But the scripture said he was 500 years old. I can't picture that. How many generations do we have to put together they put up 500 years. That's older than the church. If Noah was born when this church was built, he wasn't old enough to come to the flood yet. He had only been 325 years old. Now 175 years to go before God told him he had something for him to do. You know how much the world has changed? Since the days when this church was built, the middle road was a gravel road. And there were horse stables out there where they tied the horses up during church to keep them out of the weather and gave them water and gave them food so that the animals weren't suffering while they were in here worshiping. Nobody salt of the sidewalk in those days during the snow. He was 500 years old. And God said to him in the 500 years that he was all the things I just said about. And then God whispered in his ear. <laughs> Noah, I got a job for you. You know, all of us like it some days when people say they have a job for us. One of the needs that we all have, I don't care who you are, is the need to be needed. One of the senses of being alone and abandoned is nobody needs me. Nobody wants me, nobody needs me. I guess I'm not important. The need to be needed. Needed by your family, needed by a companion, needed by the organization you belong to. The need to be needed. We all need it. One of the things the parents go through after their children grow up is all of a sudden, there's nobody there that they're going to cook breakfast for, or clean house for, or do wash for. Nobody there that they can listen to. They're jabberwacky. It doesn't always make sense, because it's fun to listen to. And they're lost. They're psychologically lost. 
It's called a midlife crisis. They don't know what to do. And many an adult person goes astray in their life at that age. Try to reinvent their life and do the things they gave up when they were raising children. And they get in trouble. I got a lot to talk about in this chapter and I'm out of time. I hope most of you go down. If all of you don't go downstairs, got a couple of things to decide on tonight. And I need you down there. So let's stand together. We're supposed